Hello, and welcome to The Gallimorphery, a podcast about history. I'm Will, and joining me remotely, as always, is my co-host Nick. How are you doing, Nick? Hello, yes. I'm, I'm all right, actually. You know, I'm, I'm enjoying this sort of lockdown distance. It's, it's provided a lot of clarity for my life. Well, that, that's good to know. Um, let's not ask any more questions about that. It's snowing today, which is a, a rare sight. Um, normally, you can't see the snow through the um, the concrete walls of the basement. So, yeah, surely put a window in there, shouldn't we? Well, never mind. But with that, why don't we take a listen to this episode's audio cue? <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about the 1904 Olympics, which was the third Olympiad. I, I have mixed feelings about the Olympics. I quite like, I, I like the idea of the Olympics. I think it's a bit like the World Cup. Is when it Before it happens, you get quite excited and then and you sit down and watch it and you go, oh, well, actually. Well, that's because we're English. It's, it's worse if you're Irish or Scottish or Welsh. Well, what happens, what happens if you're um, Irish, Scottish or Welsh? You, you never get to the bloody World Cup. Anyway. The Olympics, however, the Irish, uh, well, the Northern Irish anyway, the Welsh and the Scottish can get can get there because they're part of Great Britain. The very first modern Olympics, though, uh, began in Greece in 1896. It was actually conceived a few years before uh, in Paris, in France. And the, the, the guy behind it all was a guy called Baron Pierre de Coubertin. I've said that wrong, but let's move on. Uh, and he was basically a French aristocrat who fell in love with sport while he was in England. So he was watching lots of rugby games and he just sort of became entranced by the idea of athletic ability, sort of propelling people together and propelling society forward. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? The um, the modern Olympics are sort of associated with uh, ancient Greek traditions, but really um, a, a lot of the, the aspects of the Olympics that, that we think of as, as traditional are also quite modern. Things like carrying the torch, the whole business with the medals and the podium, it's all... Um, Mostly 20th century innovations. Funny enough, what's, what's also interesting is that obviously Pierre was, was French and a lot of sort of sporting events and committees were actually started by the French in the 19th and 20th centuries. But it's really sort of the English who enjoyed sport more. In fact, <laughs> it did, the French didn't view sports as a serious pastime. They saw it as a very English concept and preferred the more intellectual pursuits of literature, art, coffee... So, yeah, it's, it's actually quite fascinating that all these major sporting competitions were kind of spearheaded by French people that were bucking the trend. I, lo- I love the idea that, um, that a nation can develop like the, you know, the most significant event in a field. And that is a field that they're, they're barely interested in. <laughs> yes. Anyway, but yes, Pierre de Coubertin was behind all this. You know, he helped develop the five ring Olympic symbol in 1913. So a way after this event actually happened but he also was behind the olympic charter the athlete's oath as you mentioned the sort of torchy stuff kind of symbolizing hope and regeneration but the main reason he came up with this idea was sort of use athletics to create unity the first olympics itself was actually a roaring success and uh uh, when it finished uh, the greeks actually wanted to keep it in athens and say we we should have it here every four years but but Kubatam and the committee were very much keen to make it an international event uh, no no actual home bias here but the next olympics after athens was held in paris in uh, in 1900 ah oh, sneaky i see what he did there uh, it was an absolute disaster it nearly killed the olympics <laughs> basically the french government paired it with a world's fair so world's fair were all the rage in the victorian era the late victorian era basically they were a chance for countries to show off all their technical scientific cultural abilities and aspects and, and the french government didn't give two rats asses about the olympics and conceived of it as a sideshow to the fair most of the athletes who competed in it didn't realize they're actually taking part in an olympic event i i love i love that it was their idea being hosted in their capital and still they just they didn't really care uh, I mean, it's, it nearly killed off the olympics and and it lasted a, a good few months uh but uh, it didn't, thankfully, because we've still got the Olympics today, even if I don't enjoy them. Millions of people around the world do. The next place the Olympics was going to be was going to be North America in the New World or in the Americas, because they wanted to take it out of Europe and across the pond to to keep spreading this idea. And so, funny enough, St. Louis, which I'm calling St. Louis because that's the French pronunciation, but it's actually St. Louis. 
So apologies to uh, Americans, but St. Louis didn't initially start out as the first choice. We can consider it even for you uh, horribly butchering the name of the... Um... I prefer to think that when I pronounce something, it's because it's the correct way. Oh, obviously. Yeah, I mean, that that is the British way, isn't it? If we, if we do it wrong, it's because really we're right and everyone else is wrong. In, in many ways, you could kind of see Brexit coming, then, couldn't you? <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so St. Louis wasn't actually the first choice for the, uh, for the host city in North America. In fact, when the Olympic Committee met... Uh, to choose the city, the, and that was in 1901. The only American city that took part was Chicago. And at that committee in 1901, where they chose the city, Chicago was also chosen unanimously. So how did it end up in St. Louis? Well, in 1904, St. Louis was going to celebrate with the World's Fair the centenary of the Louisiana Purchase, which was this massive deal in America where they basically acquired a whole bunch of states. I don't think this is quite well known outside of america but i believe it's it's sort of at least in previous years it was considered a, a sort of source of pride in america it was something that's quite well known and it, it was a major factor in the in the westward expansion but in 1803 france under the rule of napoleon had found itself in possession of a quite a large amount of territory in north america that they'd won it from spain so Napoleon offered this land for sale to uh, the United States. Thomas Jefferson uh, saw this as quite a good deal. And in, in the end, they agreed to purchase it for $15 million, which worked out to about $18 per square mile. Quite a large stretch of land, uh, stretching from sort of Montana in the north down to Louisiana in the south. So it was a good deal. Uh, well done, Thomas Jefferson. Bit of an underachiever, that, that Jefferson. Don't know yeah. what else he's done, yeah. really. Waste of space. It did, however, contain quite a lot of land that France didn't really own. Mo most of the land was currently being inhabited by uh, Native American tribes. It's a classic European imperialist move. What they were really selling to the American was more of a preemptive right over these lands, so that if, if anybody were to, uh, to walk in and decide to take these lands off the Native Americans, America would kind of get first dibs on that. Um, so they were selling the right to invade. But no, no, nonetheless, uh, it, it was a, a major purchase um, for America. And it was something which was deemed important enough to celebrate 100 years later with the, um, the World Fair in St. Louis. Yeah. And as you said, it was a majorly important event. That was a problem. It was a problem for St. Louis. It was a problem for Chicago because both didn't want the events to overshadow each other. Uh, and it gets worse because we introduce a figure now who it basically becomes a staple for the story, but also a staple in the history of the sort of burgeoning IOC. And that was James Sullivan. And he was the head of the American Athletics Union, which was a major sporting body in, in the States uh, and a driving force in the idea of American athleticism. He didn't like the IOC. He didn't like Kubertan because he always felt a bit sidelined by them. When he heard the Olympics were coming to Chicago, he threatened to hold competitions in St. Louis. This was a major problem for the IOC because now you suddenly had uh, a major rival to the Olympics and you know it was still a burgeoning idea. Paris had been a disaster. They needed to get it off the ground. So they tried to come up with compromises. I think initially the idea that Chicago would just host it a year later was floated but they really didn't want to delay it. Coubertin, who'd actually been to St. Louis before and remark that it had no beauty and no originality, sort of had to reluctantly move the event to St. Louis, which was a massive coup for them because they kind of had a rivalry with Chicago. Chicago had won the 1893 World's Fair and it had been a roaring success and really invigorated their town. And, and when St. Louis lost that bid, they kind of, the town sort of crumbled a bit. It's, uh, it's also interesting to note that, that Coubertin chose not to attend the, uh, the games in St. Louis uh, he, he claimed that he believed the Olympiad would match the mediocrity of the town. So uh, obviously no hard feelings there. I suppose, it, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this later, but it, in some ways, uh, Coubertin was proven right by doubting St. Louis' um, suitability for hosting the Olympics. I mean, so much crazy stuff happened. He was absolutely right to, to doubt it. But the fact that he didn't attend meant that James Sullivan had the run over the entire event. He organised exactly what sports were going to go into it. He dictated all the rules. He was basically a little king of the event. So it was, it was good for him. 
Um, and of course, because it was tied to the World's Fair, like the Paris Olympics, it lasted bloody months again. Mm. So these games officially ran, they think, from Ju- and they only think this, from July the 1st to November the 23rd and consisted of at least 94 events. It must have been quite draining. Um, the only time the Olympics have dragged on for longer was the next Olympics, the 1908 in London, which dragged on for 188 days. So, Do we know why it dragged on? I never looked into that. No, we don't. I mean, my, that's as far as my source went. Uh, I, I assume it was just a sort of British stubbornness of, of not being outdone. One of the other things was because it was in America, you ended up having a lot of nations just not going. So a, a great deal. In fact, 523 of 630 athletes that participated were Americans. There was a certain reluctance of other countries to attend it uh, because St. Louis is qu- kind of hard to get to, you know, in 1904 for foreign countries. It, it's a slow and expensive journey. And a lot of countries just didn't want to have to pay to send their athletes out there. So you end up with only 12 countries actually taking part. Uh, America actually won more medals in the 1904 Olympics than they have in any other Olympic Games. They won 239, which is more than half of all the events. Uh, so that was <laughs> I nice. think it's I think it's around 75%, which is the largest ever haul in a single Olympics. But yeah. But one of the interesting <laughs> things was that a lot of the Americans that competed weren't actually Americans. <laughs> These were recent immigrants, though, who hadn't yet received citizenship. Um, I believe Norway still to this day claims two gold medals for um, for wrestling from these games that they believe should have gone to Norwegian citizens. The Europeans that did attend, as we mentioned, were kind of, uh, to put it mildly, a bit dicked over by the competition rules because they were completely alien to them. They'd always, you know, played by different rules, literally played by different rules. So, for instance... The diving competition caused great consternation with the Germans, who, as we know, are not really a fan of rules. I don't think they're known for, you know, that, no, they're, are they? they're a, bit, a bit fast and loose, aren't they, those Germans? Yeah. <laughs> Basically, the European way of diving was that you are graceful and gymnastic and amazing while you're flying through the air, but your landing didn't actually matter. You could like belly flop, which is weird to think about because modern olympics you have to stick your landing and that was the american way of doing it so the americans basically said you can be graceful in the air but you have to have a clean landing and the the germans didn't realize this and obviously they dived and were beautiful but then they ended up sort of smashing into the water so they were docked points i mean that is my personal (laughs) style of diving as well Um, (laughs) so if yeah a graceful approach followed by belly flop (laughs) um so, yeah, they were dock points for that and obviously ended up ceding the medals to the Americans who followed the rules. Um, and then in water polo, you didn't have an inflated ball. You had a deflated ball, which you then had to carry into the opponent's goal, whereas the Germans were used to playing with an inflated ball and then sort of smashing it into the back. So they completely bombed there as well. Ah. Um, and But that didn't actually matter in the end because the Germans fielded a team who weren't from the same athletic club, so they got disqualified. <laughs> but it was, it was actually a blessing in disguise because um, 21 of the players from the New York and the Chicago Athletic Club, which competed in the final, later died of typhus from the water. Remember, there's a World's Fair going on and they had an agricultural section and the water they played in had been used quite frequently by the animals. So they were literally swimming in shitty water. This rather sort of non-committal approach to to the the well-being of the athletes is something that really carries through quite a lot of events at these Olympic Games as well, I think. Uh, it totally was. One of the interesting things about it was that it was almost like an experiment in, e- in eugenics and anthropology, not just because of Sullivan, who has had all these weird ideas of research around athleticism he wanted to explore. But uh, at the World's Fair itself, there was a department of anthropology and ethnology so do you remember in the Zoo podcast, we were talking about, obviously, people would come and they'd, they'd go to exhibits all around indigenous tribes. This, they had the same thing at this World's Fair. Sullivan decided, along with the, the head of this Department of Anthropology and Ethnology, who was called Professor William McGee, he had some quite strong views about the white race being utterly superior. 
basically they had the good idea of taking the people from the world's fair that they had on display and making them compete against each other so you had japanese aboriginals pygmies uh tribes from argentina called the patagonians loads of different native american uh tribes in fact there were 40 tribes in total and six philippine villages they decided to also have them compete against people who weren't white in America as well. So uh, black Americans, Asian Americans threw them in and they made them all compete. And uh, it it lasted over two days. They got them doing, you know, long jump, running, javelin, archery. And they wanted to sort of really test the athletic ability of the so-called savage races. And actually to their surprise, (laughs) they were quite disappointed. All the native Americans were terrible archery and javelin. Of course, these... (laughs) These people that they'd kind of pulled from the uh, the human zoo exhibit, they didn't give them any training when it came to th- these uh, these sports or, or tell them the instructions. There was this idea that they could just drop them in and they would just naturally be amazing at, at sort of Olympic sports. That's exactly it. It was the idea that these races were deemed savage, therefore they had this innate ability to be absolutely brilliant at certain things particularly archery in fact i think the winner of the archery contest was the only person to hit the target all the rest missed yeah james sullivan he he concluded that um the savage has been a very much overrated man from an (laughs) athletic point of view which seems a bit unfair really um though um going back to uh cooperton um he uh he referred to it as an outrageous charade um, so he obviously wasn't very impressed by this either. Crazy, crazy stuff. But it wasn't as crazy as the marathon race. So this is this is kind of the really the famous event, isn't yes. it? Yes. Um, that that people remember from these games, um, the the infamous marathon. It, it all goes back to James Sullivan, doesn't it? It does. Uh, the marathon race slightly different to what we know from today. It's you know it's not just over twenty six miles. It was almost twenty five miles back then. And they decided to hold it in August in blistering 32.2 Celsius degree heat. Uh, and the marathon consisted of uh, 25 miles all along St. Louis's dirt roads, stone highways, seven hills up to 300 feet high. They had to dodge the actual people of St. Louis who were just going about their daily life because the, the, the course went through the city, past the trams. So it was almost like an assault course as well as a marathon. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, just for the, the sake of clarity to anyone who's not familiar with marathons, um, they normally start in the morning when it's a bit cooler. Um, and they're not, you don't normally have to dodge traffic and cars and, and people. Uh, that, that's quite uh, rare for a marathon as far as, as far as I'm aware. And, and yeah, so in addition to that, sorry, there were only two places where the athletes could drink. So uh, it's six miles in, there was a water tower, and then 12 miles in, there was a roadside well. You might be wondering why there was this sort of, um, this, this sort of half-hearted approach to water stops. Um, again, we go back to James Sullivan. Uh, he, had this, he had some kind of strange theories uh, when it came to uh, athletes and, and human biology. And he wanted to test dehydration's effect on, on athletes and sort of uh, the human limits. He had this idea that he would observe the athletes, how how they um, were able to cope with these conditions. The spoiler, uh, not well. Yes, of, of, of the 41 contestants signed up, only 32 showed up and only 14 finished the race. In fact, it, it, was, it went so well that they almost had the first fatality of an Olympic marathon ever when William Garcia from California collapsed on the side of the road and was hospitalised with hemorrhaging mainly because the dirt roads they were running on, the dust had got into his stomach and just ripped ripped it apart. I think there's another fella suffered a bout of vomiting, had to give up. One of the contestants was chased off the course by wild dogs. Yes, he was one of um, two South Africans who turned up barefoot. The guy who eventually won it was a guy called Thomas Hicks. And he was one of the, the favourites because he, you know, he had pedigree in the Boston Marathon and, and other things like that. But he, he quickly suffered from dehydration in these conditions and repeatedly beg for water but the officials instead of giving him water they gave him a sponge soaked in warm water it's seven miles from the finish they decided to give him egg whites 
mixed with strychnine. It's, uh, it's I think it's what they put in rat poison. Yes, uh, it, but it was commonly used as a stimulant at the time. And so they gave him this. It didn't really work that well. He staggered on for a bit longer. They gave it to him again. So they gave him two doses of strychnine with egg whites and then a little bit of French brandy. <laughs> <laughs> And then, why not? I mean, at that point, why not just give him some brandy? And then he, he got he got to the stadium where the finish line was, and, and basically he couldn't walk. So, that, so his trainers had to pick him up and imitate him running across the finish line. <laughs> and by the end of the race, he'd lost eight pounds in weight. Um, yes, and I believe he also needed uh, immediate life-saving medical attention as he, well. He, he did, yeah. But the real story of the marathon was the guy who was supposedly the initial winner, and that was Fred Laws. Fred Laws was a, a bricklayer from New York. You know, you, you could be a bricklayer and still enter the Olympics in the marathon. So Fred Laws, after a few miles of the marathon, he developed severe cramps uh, and decided he was going to drop out of the race. So he, he hitched a ride with a car to take him back to the finish line, but the car broke down after 10 miles. At this point, he was most of the way there, so he decided he would just run the rest, having overcome his cramps uh, and ended up finishing first so initially he he was crowned sort of the winner of the race i think that uh, there was sort of pictures taken of him with uh, teddy roosevelt's daughter and until it was eventually found out that he had actually taken a car for 10 miles of it and he was disqualified at the time uh, his excuse was that it was all just an elaborate joke i, I love i love that he just he just turns up and just <laughs> realizes that everybody thinks he's coming first i think mean, oh okay i guess I guess I'm first then. I mean, how do you explain to a crowd of like hundreds, if not thousands of people that, oh, you, no, I'm out. I took a car here. I, I, you know what? I'll just cross the line. But yeah, that, that was that was the marathon, really. It's just a crazy, crazy mixture of <laughs> cheating, narcotics and near death experience. On, on the topic of cheating, in the, the boxing, there was a, a fighter named James Bollinger. And he entered himself under the name of, of another local boxer who was quite popular called Carol Burton in, in the hopes that he would curry favour with the judges. I guess assuming that he was this sort of uh, this local popular boxer. <laughs> uh, he, he actually succeeded in winning one match before he was found out and disqualified. They weren't too fussy about the kind of athletes who, who were allowed to take part in these games. But- yeah, but as as we've said, this you've got to remember, this was when athletics was really forming as a serious career choice, and it was more of a pastime to keep fit. So it kind of makes sense that it was more experimental at this stage as they were figuring out what they needed. Weirdly, there was one guy called George Louis Iser, who was a German-American gymnast who competed and won six medals in one day, including three gold and two silver, and he did it all with a wooden leg. I mean, I, I I struggle to do a forward roll and I have two legs. So to win six medals in the Olympics with a wooden leg, that is pretty impressive. Yeah, it's kind of sad, though. that I mean, they were allowing, you know, bricklayers and, and frauds and postmen and all these sort of uh, odd characters were allowed to take part. And yet women were only allowed to take part in the archery. But Yes, it was... Uh incredibly sad when considering the previous olympics they they'd had more events to compete in so it's it it was a bit strange but i guess it you know this is america and it's a bit more conservative than perhaps europe was uh the winner of that archery contest just just out of interest was the ohio cincinnati archers club star Lida howell uh, however there was also one other event but it wasn't listed as an official olympic event and that was boxing no medals were awarded but amazingly Women would never box again in the Olympics until the 2012 Summer Games in London. It's also interesting that 1904 is the year when boxing, uh, for men or women, made its Olympic debut. Well, it's funny you say that. <laughs> so, we did mention there were over 94 events. So these are in the own words of uh, Sullivan. This is what he said. We have had in St. Louis under the Olympic banner. Handicap. Athletic meets, interscholastic meets, Turner's Mass exercises, baseball, international gymnastic championships, championships with public school boys, lacrosse, swimming, basketball, rowing, sailing, bicycles, 
Roquet tournaments, whatever those are. Fencing tournaments, a special week for the Olympics Young Men's Christian Association Championships. <laughs> Tennis tournaments, golf tournaments, <laughs> archery tournaments, wrestling, boxing, gymnastics. <gasps> As well as the Olympic Games that decided the world's championships at track and field sports. It's kind of funny that, that the Olympics was sort of a footnote in that. It was like, oh, and the Olympics. I think it's important to remember this was only the, the third um, modern Olympic Games as well. It was, it was really early days for the competition. It, it wasn't the, the huge thing that it is these days. In many ways, the, the St. Louis Olympics were actually a success as much as I don't like to agree with Sullivan, who later said, without question, these were the greatest athletic games ever held in the world. I mean, that's incredibly debatable. (laughs) But the games did succeed in winning the hearts and minds of America. You needed something like the 1904 Olympics to really draw attention to the cause. It succeeded in doing that. So if that all felt like a bit of a marathon to get through, um, why don't we move on to our interesting facts? Uh, So my interesting fact is the 1904 Olympic Games was the first Olympic Games uh, where the winning athletes were awarded gold, silver and bronze medals for coming first, second and third place. Despite the whole thing being kind of a shambles, uh, this one really endearing tradition uh, got its start here. Yeah, uh, when when the Olympic Games first came back, they were actually given uh, the winner was crowned with an olive wreath, very Greek, and uh, received a silver medal. So you know they upgraded. And what did you get if you came third? You got fuck all. Oh, <laughs> my interesting fact uh, is is about food and drink. So the, so obviously the Olympics was held in conjunction with the World's Fair. And at the World's Fair, there are a number of notable introductions to the American public of food and drink that became popular. One of the things uh, introduced, debuted nationally, was Dr. Pepper. Oh, that, I didn't know Dr. Pepper was that old. It's one of the world's old, oldest soft drinks. What flavour is Dr. Pepper supposed to be? I've always wondered this. Fruit. Fruit flavour. That's It literally says on a bottle, it says fruit flavoured <laughs> soft, soft drink. Love it. It's just so non-committal. So yeah, it's it's fruit. This is the part of the podcast where we try and dispel some uh, misconceptions or myths about the topic. How did you go? Did you want to go first? Mine actually relates back to food again. <laughs> I was just very hungry when I was lo- watching and reading all this information about sports. But there's this myth that the ice cream cone was invented at the, the 1904 World's Fair and Olympics. Uh, and it wasn't. It just became very popular because obviously lots of stalls were selling it. Uh, the ice cream cone was actually invented back in Italy in 1896 by a guy named Marchioni. Uh, and then basically he started selling that in New York. So my myth is, uh, my myth actually goes back to Thomas Hicks of... Uh of the marathon um who we spoke about earlier now thomas hicks um famously was um drugged by his trainer with strychnine and brandy his trainer allegedly believes at the time that these were performance enhancing that they would they would help him to complete the marathon in better time we now know they didn't kind of had the opposite effect really surprisingly enough nearly killing him but uh, i mean if we put aside the whole you know willfully poisoning thomas hicks to one side the fact that he was giving the athlete drugs to try and enhance his ability was not against the rules at the time Uh, he would not have been disqualified for that drugs were only banned at the olympics in 1968 those were the days men were men and uh, men on drugs were men on drugs so um nick what did you think about uh about uh, the topic of this program has it changed your point of view about the olympics as a whole no stick them all on drugs i'd watch that okay so uh next time on the gallimore free uh we're going to be looking into the past which is uh, a bit unusual for us um uh, <laughs> and we're going to look at some very old outdated pointless technology called radio uh, 
I don't know why anyone wouldn't listen to that. I, I tell you, what, I do love radio. I get I get a lot of stick because whenever someone says, "Have you watched the game?" I said, "Oh, I heard it on the wireless." It's probably your use of the term wireless. If we're being honest here, I have a wireless radio. It's a miracle. Cool. Yeah. Well, you can tell us all about your wireless radio um, in the next episode. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Take care. Bye. Bye.